Well, we're studying the book of Revelation. And uh, the most important part of that book, we feel, is chapters 2 and 3. So we're spending very careful attention to those. And we are going to be exploring tonight the third of seven letters by Jesus Christ to His churches. A letter to the church at Pergamos. And uh, it's the fifth of 24 sessions. But just by way of warm-up and review, we're dealing in... It's the revelation. Notice that it's singular. The word in the Greek means the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's the consummation of all things. It's the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to announce a special blessing on the reader or the listener. And no other book in the Bible has singles itself out the way this book does. And there are 404 verses in the book that include within them 800, more than 800, uh, allusions from the Old Testament alone. And I mention that because one of the reasons it may sound strange to our ears is because most of us uh, don't know the Old Testament like we should. The more you understand the Old Testament, the more comfortable this book becomes. And uh, it presents the climax of God's plan for man. As I looked at the slide in the, in the earlier to, uh, today, I thought, gee, that's not the way I want to say it. It's not the man. It's you and me, Mr. and Mrs. Man, if you will. It's the climax of God's plan for you and for me. And so it's a very, very key book. It's, a, it's strange that this book, with all that's got going for it, is the least studied and the least preached on book from the pulpits of America. But uh, one of the things we did last time, and I thought I'd just mention it here to put in perspective, we had a little backgrounder on the Olivet Discourse, which is that, t- that uh, famous discourse that was a uh, response to four disciples coming to Jesus and asking Him about a second coming. And uh, it, his, his response is recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And uh, in each of those accounts, there's a group of signs that emerge very prominently within each presentation. And these list of signs, the emergence of false Christ, wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and so forth, famines, uh, death and martyrs, and, and ultimately global chaos, those signs are highlighted in Matthew and Luke and Mark, but they also will become very prominent to us when we get to Revelation chapter 6. The same pattern is there, and that's noted by most scholars. Um, But uh, the Matthew account is familiar to most of us that have studied prophecy. Since Matthew took shorthand, most of us tend to lean on Matthew's very detailed account. And for for 1,700 years, scholars have assumed that all those are talking about the same presentation. And it's called the harmonization of the Gospels, among other things. And um, it's interesting if we stand back and set aside our presuppositions, we notice that Luke's account is actually quite different than Matthew's. And therein, that generates a great deal of confusion. In fact, when you get to Luke, uh, when Matthew goes through his presentation, he mentions those signs, and then shall the abomination of desolation occur, and then, and then, and then it's... Most of what he talks about comes after that group of signs. But if you look at what Luke says, uh, start about verse 11, he says, "...and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, famines, pestilences, and fearful signs, and great signs shall be from heaven." But I want you to notice what he says, those next four words. "...but before all these shall they lay hands on you, and persecute you, and delivering you up to the synagogues, and prisons, and so forth." Most of what Luke says focuses on what occurs before those signs. What Matthew talks about occurs after those signs. And therein lies a a, a glimmer of insight. And uh, they have different emphases. Luke says, before all these signs. Matthew says, all these the beginning of sorrows, then shall they, etc. And they're talking in reference to this series of signs. False Christs, wars, famines, earthquakes. What's interesting is that Luke's emphasis is before those signs, Matthew's after those signs. And once that you understand that, suddenly the fog begins to lift. If we take Luke's account and Matthew's and put them side by side, verse by verse, we'll discover that they all talk about uh, wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth. And they also climax at the end with some cosmic upheaval and so forth. And the second coming of Christ, etc. But what Luke talks about in most of his presentation occurs before those signs. And he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., And that's well recognized by most scholars. In fact, many scholars so focus on that 
they take the position that all the rest of it has already been fulfilled in 70 AD, which is patently not true. The only, can, the only way you can hold that view is to allegorize all the rest of it. And uh, so when Matthew talks about after those signs, he then says, then shall be the abomination of desolation, a very specific thing that Jesus focuses on, and so forth. That all comes after that. And he, that ushers in a period of time that Jesus himself labels as the Great Tribulation. He's quoting from Daniel 12. And uh, this is desolation number two. In other words, we have two desolations of Jerusalem in view. Luke is talking about one earlier, uh, Matthew, one after those signs. Two different ones. And so the first generation is, uh, Luke sa says, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. And it's 38 years later from that point that Jerusalem falls. The 38 years being very significant because that's exactly the length of the generation that wandered in the wilderness before Kiddush Barnea and all that. So uh, when Matthew talks about this generation shall not pass, he's talking about the last generation. And how long is that? We don't know because unless those days are shortened, there should no flesh be saved. So it's a totally different thing altogether. In any case, we're, we're, uh, that's just by way of summary. The main reason I bring this up in this study is because clearly the seven letters to seven churches occur after the fall of Jerusalem, because that fell in 70 A.D., and this is, these letters are being written about 95, 96 A.D., about 20 years later. And yet they obviously occur prior to these uh, wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth. And so uh, that'll become even more significant as we get into more and more of the prophetic aspects of the seven letters. But that's all. It's interesting, as you reflect on all of this, that Luke is writing to Gentiles. And he's focusing the Gentile Christians on what's coming and uh, during, uh, uh, when uh, Vespasian and uh, his son Titus were mopping up in the north, up in Tiberias and these various cities, Nero had told Vespasian to bring war against the Jews, and he was doing that. But about 96 AD, Nero dies. And Vespasian ends up getting tangled up in the Rome politics, and he ends up emerging as the emperor of the Roman Empire. He leaves his son, Titus, to attack Jerusalem, in which he does, sets the siege up that causes ultimately Jerusalem to fall. But there's a hiatus in that siege. And Eusebius, among others, points out that the Christians that heard this presentation knew that when, they were, when the armies were coming to get out of town, they did. They went to a place called Pella in North Petraea. And there are some scholars believe that no, in, in spite of the fact that 1,100,000 were killed in the fall of Jerusalem, no Christians were. Because if they followed Jesus' directions, they were out of there before the siege sealed it up. And uh, all that trauma and, and that, that Josephus... We have a detailed first-hand account of it all in Josephus if you're interested in reading his uh, stuff on, called The uh, Wars of the Jews and so on. In any case, uh, that's just by way of review from last time. Let's just uh, get back to the book of Revelation. To whom was the book given? This is Many people don't read the first sentence. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto whom? Jesus Christ. Exactly. No wonder it's such a treasure. Um, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent, and he signified it. Signified it is a, uh, rendering it into signs or semimes. And uh, one of the things that first got me excited about the Bible as a, uh, my young teens was a, a lecturer that was speaking uh, a series he pointed out the whole book of Revelation is in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. I thought, wow, that's interesting. What a treasure hunt. And indeed it was. And that changed my life. But in any case, uh, it is signified or signed, and every sign is explained somewhere. Most of it right in the book itself, many elsewhere. That's what takes, takes you from those 400 verses into the 800 of allusions of the Old Testament, for example. Okay. But here's the promise that we're going to claim tonight, you and I. We're here together for verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, well, this whole book was sent to seven key churches. Seven churches. Strange. Why these churches? Because there are over a hundred churches that were active in those days. Why these seven? Because Jesus picked these seven because of their incredible appropriateness, as we'll discover as we get into them. Not only for that day, but for, through all, all of history. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, that's the, that's the province of Asia, not Asia as we tend to use the term continentally. It's essentially that region we call Turkey. 
Grace unto you and peace from him who, which is, which was, and which is to come, and the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. These are a few of uh, 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 seven labels that Jesus introduces of himself, and those labels will be identity pieces throughout the rest of the book, and we'll link that up as we go. In chapter 1 we have an introduction, we have the salutation and the occasion where he's on Patmos and all that. We have a, per, a, a, a description of Jesus Christ, the vision of him. The, the risen Christ is described by John as he sees him. But then we have verse 19, which is very precious. It's the only book I know of in the Bible that gives you its outline. Usually when you take a book to study, the first thing you, do, you want to do is outline it. Well, John has done that for you, and uh, so we'll take a look at this. John is told to write three things. Write the things which thou hast seen, and that's obviously an allusion to the physical description of Christ that precedes these verses, and the things which are, present tense, first is past tense, this is the things which exist right now, and the things which shall be hereafter. And obviously the vision of Christ are the things he has seen by the time he gets to that verse. The things which are the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and then the things that are after the seven churches, uh, which shall be, uh, uh, and we'll get into that of course when we get chapter 4. But the point is, uh, for you and I, the most important part of the entire book, and it's a fantastic book, but the most important part is chapters 2 and 3 because that affects you and me. From chapter 4 on, I believe we'll be watching it from the mezzanine, okay? But we're going to focus our attention on these seven churches. And then that chapter closes with a couple of lessons here. Jesus says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. So here's an example where these idioms are used earlier in the chapter, but before the chapter closes, they're explained to you. And we're going to find these little explanations all through the book. Most of the critical symbols are explained for you in the book as we go. Others are allusions from the Old Testament that are e easily uh, chased down. Now these seven churches, that's where we, why these seven is a key question you need to gr come to grips with. Each of the letters has a common phrase that closes the letter. We find this strange phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This phrase occurs seven times here, of course, with the seven letters. It also occurs seven times elsewhere in the New Testament. And I'll let you chase that down as a treasure hunt. But this tells us there are at least four levels of application or interpretation of these letters. The first is local. These were real churches. As we get into this, we'll spend a little bit of time on identifying just where they were, what their problems were, what their history was. They were real local churches. These were not fictions, these are not parables, they're not uh, just little idiomatic stories to get a point across. They were real live churches at the time. But as we learn, uh, uh, we discover these seven letters are report cards on each of these churches. There are seven report cards. And you notice this Holy Spirit says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Let's not forget as we go through these that each letter is applicable to every church. I don't know what church you're going to, but I can tell you there, is, there are elements of all seven in your church. 10% of this and 70% of that maybe or whatever, but the point is if you understand those seven letters, you can map spiritually the condition of any church. And uh, so that's, so they're all, we, we, it'll be easy for us to sit on the sidelines and say, oh, those guys did this and didn't do that, you know, well, hey, be careful, because we may see that same thing going on in the, in the mirror when we shave in the morning. So, and that leads us to, it says, He that hath an ear, and I always ask an audience, how many of you have earlobes? How many bright earlobes there? Okay, that it's written to you, personally, despite what church you might belong to. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this, there's a personal application, or what could be formally called a homiletic application. Hopefully, you will take away from these studies uh, an insight into your own personal report card before the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, those three, if that was all that was here, that would be plenty. That's rich material. That's terrific. But there is a little icing on the cake. There's a fourth level that, frankly, is astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. It's the kind of thing that I won't try to sell you. You need to see it for yourself. But I think what you'll discover is there's a fourth level, a prophetic implication. It turns out 
that these seven letters lay out a history of the church. The book of Acts covered about 30 years. The book of Revelation covers about 2,000. And it lays it all out in advance. You'll be able to figure out where we are historically in that line as we go. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fun stuff. <laughs> now we'll discover that each of the letters have seven elements. There's the name of the church. And the name of the church will be a clue to what that letter's main theme is. Each letter, each of the seven, has a particular theme, a particular focus, some good news, some bad news, some exhortation, so forth. The title that Jesus uses of Himself is selected by Him. The title He picks is relevant to that church's need. He's got seven to choose from. And He chooses that title of Himself that fits the situation. Well, we can turn this around. As we understand the title he's using, it helps us draw an inference as to what is the issue that's really lurking under the surface with this church. Then there's a commendation. He mentions the church, and he mentions the title of himself, and then he starts the report card. The first element is, here's the good news. This, these are things you've done well. Well done on this and this and this and this. But then there's also expression of concern. You're not doing this, this, and this. And that leads, of course, to an exhortation or a challenge. Repent. Do this. Do this. You follow me? It's a report card. What's interesting, to get ahead of the story a little bit, when we do all seven, we'll be able to look back and conclude that every one of the churches was surprised. The ones that thought they were doing well were not doing well. The ones that were doing, uh, uh, thought they were doing poorly were doing better than they thought. And the humbling thing about that is whatever we perceive of our church is probably wrong. Places that we think we're not doing well enough, we might be doing, in the Lord's eyes, better than we're giving ourselves credit for. And on the other hand, there's places we think we're doing pretty well that we may be overlooking what we really want. So these are sobering issues. Each letter has a promise to the individual overcomer. Each one's distinctive, but consistent with the theme of the letter, of course. And then we have this closing phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's almost like a, a marker at the end of the letter, except it has some strange exceptions. Well, we went through the, we, uh, we're in the third of the first three, and uh, we went through Ephesus. The name meant the desired one, and uh, they were doing well on doctrine. They got rid of people who were heretics, but they, the thing, concern was they had lost their first love. What, the main theme of that letter is that Jesus desires devotion, not just doctrine. And that's really the theme to the, to the, the, the letter to the Ephesians. And then we had the promise of the overcomer. But when we, when we got through all this, we noticed something strange about the structure of that letter. The promise to the overcomer was like a P.S. It's after the close of the letter. Now, we're not going to make a big thing of this now, but I want you to notice this before we get through all seven, because we're going to come back to that whole dis- the issue of the architecture. Smyrna, the same thing. We went through Smyrna means myrrh, suggestive of embalming or death. All the way through that letter is this uh, uh, cloud of persecution that hung over Smyrna. In fact, we noticed something very interesting about Smyrna that you wouldn't notice unless you've been outlining this carefully. There's a piece missing. There's a piece missing. There is no concern. It's one of two letters of the seven of which there is nothing negative said. Virtually all the letters have something good and something bad. Two of the letters have nothing bad about them, nothing of concern. In other words, an A report card. And uh, Smyrna is one of them. Two of, the, two of the churches have nothing good said about them. Laodicea and one other that will surprise you. But we're getting ahead of the story. So we're in Pergamos, the third of the bunch. Now, we also said these letters have a prophetic profile. Ephesus, as we examined it, would seem to fit the apostolic church, very appropriately, the church of that first century. Smyrna clearly was the persecuted church. And because it's enduring such persecution, Jesus says, I'm not going to lay anything else on you. Just hang in there. It's basically a story. Never give up. If I can steal my wife's title to her new book. Never give up. That's basically the message to Smyrna. Well, what about Pergamos? Let's take a look at Pergamos. Pergamos is the city of the serpent. Ooh, that's spooky. Pergamos is the feminine form. Pergamum, some of your Bibles may use, is the neuter form of the same name. as Both are used. Don't let that throw you. Pergamos is about 48 miles north of Smyrna. Ephesus, the first one we studied, was the great political center. Smyrna was the great commercial center. Pergamos is the great religious center. 
and uh, as a, just by way of summary. And prior to Alexander the Great, it really wasn't much. It was just a castle on top of a hill. Its foundation uh, goes way back, and I won't take you through all of that. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we'll just keep moving. Um, its name is said to be derived from uh, uh, son of Pyrrhus and Andromache, which made himself king by killing the king in a single combat and what have you. Um, but the uh, early history, about 301 uh, B.C., Antigonus defeated uh, at, at the Battle of Ipsus in northwest Asia Minor, then was united to the Thracian kingdom of Lysimachus. Remember when Alexander the Great died, four generals divided it up. This region fell to Lysimachus, but uh, it had an impregnable position, so it was useful as a treasury. That makes it start to become important uh, commercially. But one of the generals uh, of Lysimachus under him uh, betrayed himself to his rival, Seleucus, and so there was some chicanery. But in any case, subsequent rulers to this area um, established themselves as a major dominant power in Asia Minor. Bear, bear in mind, that's the Roman designation of what we would consider uh, two-thirds of Turkey, if you will. And uh, it became a major center for Greek culture. But uh, they had the perception to ally themselves very early with Rome. As Rome begins to rise over the Greeks, they allied early with Rome. They became extremely wealthy and prosperous as a result of that. And the official capital of the Roman province of Asia for 200 years. But uh, they didn't have proximity to the main trade routes, so they eventually yielded that leadership to their rival Ephesus. But these are important cities, all three of them. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos in that, in, in throughout that early history. It's about 48 miles north of Smyrna, about 18 miles from the sea. The other two ones we looked at were harbor uh, situations. This one is not. It's in there. There's a pr- city presently in Turkey called Bergama, which has a population of about 42,000, but it was much um, larger uh, back in the New Testament period, about 200,000 they estimate. Interestingly enough, Zeus, the god Zeus, is said among the Greeks to have been born there. And uh, to celebrate that, there's a huge, huge altar. It's uh, almost 800 feet above the ground. It, I mean, on, on a cliff, uh, uh, protuberance there. And uh, it was over about 100 by 100, 125 by 115 feet. That's a huge, flat altar up there. It's over 50 feet high, and it's set on a colonnaded enclosure. But all of this is about 800 feet above the valley floor. Very, very prominent, very, very uh, well-known temple to Zeus, if you will. Uh, to give you a feeling of the geography, Patmos is at the middle of the bottom of the screen there. I put Athens and Istanbul on the map just so you can get a reference here. Athens to the left and Istanbul near the top. But uh, you can see where Ephesus was with respect to, to Patmos. And then nor- north of that, about 38 miles is Smyrna. And then about 48 miles north of that is Pergamos, just to give you a rough feeling of the geography. And uh, so one of the venerated idols in Pergamos was Aesculapius. And the caduceus was the official emblem of the city. This, you've seen it many, many times with the two head, headed snakes on a pole. And uh, see, Aesculapius is considered the god of healing, among other things. Many of the uh, early uh, records seem to indicate he was easy, even elevated higher than just that. But in any case, that was his main identity. And uh, I think most scholars recognize that the legend of Aesculapius uh, derives from Numbers 21. We've talked about that before in this study. Remember the brazen serpent that Moses set up there. So uh, it, 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 uh, it re-emerged from that. That whole idea of the brazen serpent is weird, but it doesn't make any sense until it's explained to us by Jesus Christ in John chapter 3. That brass serpent that was made by Moses in Numbers 21 was still around in the days of Hezekiah, so much so he had to destroy it. We'll take a look at that. Back in Numbers 21, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on upon a pole, came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now that's very great, that was great, saved the lives, but you have to stand back and say that's pretty weird. That's kind of a strange way 
These people are dying. If they will look at this pole with a brass serpent on it, they'll be healed like that. Now, if you're in the Old Testament, that's, you've got to scratch your head and wonder what's going on there. And it's interesting, we don't really understand it until you get to John when he's being visited by Nicodemus. Excuse me, but Jesus, when he's in the Gospel of John, get John 3, when, he's, when Jesus is being visited by Nicodemus at night, Jesus says to Nicodemus, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have, have eternal life. So suddenly we begin to realize why God did that back in Numbers 21, because it was a sign, an anticipatory sign of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I don't think Moses knew that. I think most prophets going through the centuries may not have understood why. It isn't until you get to John chapter 3 that Jesus lifts the fog by saying it's a sign pointing to the cross. That's really what he's saying. In fact, not only is that true, this very discussion with Nicodemus leads to the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. What's John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that's really there, appended to the explanation of, the, of Numbers 21. And so John 3.16, all of you know what I'm sure. What you may not realize, in 2 Kings 18, it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elka, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. This is good news because not all the good kings were... He's following a really bad news guy, Manasseh and the rest of it. But anyway, he removed the high places. Now these are, the bad, these, these are uh, idolatrous places. He broke the images. He cut down the groves. These are these phallic symbols they made out of trees. All the paganism that had prospered under Manasseh, his predecessor. And he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made, for in those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. In other words, this brass serpent that had occurred, that was so prominent in Numbers 21, had become a fetish. It probably has a, it has a relationship to them that the crowd of Turin has to some people today. There's a danger in these things, especially if they're authentic. I don't know if the crowd of Turin is authentic or not, but it's dangerous if it really is. People will tend to focus on that rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what uh, uh, Hezekiah did, he crushed it. He ruined it. He says he called it Nehushtan, which means a thing of brass. He destroyed it to avoid people venerating this artifact. It was, it was becoming, in effect, an idol. We've got to be careful. Interesting lessons here. Well, the legend of Aesculapius is, of course, a derivative of that. Often uh, uh, featured as a pole with a snake on it. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I made that clear. See, a snake is a, is a symbol of sin. A brass, brass was the, liver, the metal that could sustain heat. So brass speaks of judgment. It's idiomatic in the, in the Levitical things. It, it, the, the idea of a brazen serpent on a pole is a expression of sin being judged. And Jesus Christ on that cross was made sin for us, Paul tells us. So uh, that's where the idioms tie together. But in any case, uh, the, the legend of Aesculapius is, of course, uh, venerated in many, many of the ancient uh, things. Always a snake on a pole. And uh, even today, it's astonishing how many American Medical Association and others have a snake on a pole as a symbol of the medical profession. And many of the, the articles will say that comes from, es you know, the legends of es Aesculapius, but that in turn comes from something even earlier. Uh, it comes from uh, uh, Numbers 21. Are we together so far? It gets worse. And he had been recognized as the son of Apollo in their, in their system and so forth. And uh, he, they actually felt he had the power to avert death. And uh, he was uh, represented in, by the Anatolians, that's the predecessors in Turkey, by, as a serpent. The Greeks later depict him as holding Hermes' staff. That's the caduceus. Many people use that term to represent either one, but technically a caduceus is one with two snakes. The caduceus has a two-headed snake on it. But the Greeks using the caduceus are venerating Hermes. Hermes is the god of commerce, not medicine. So I was amused by that when I see a license plate, you know, where the doctor, ha if he has a caduceus on it, that means he's commercial, right? Uh, so the uh, Hermes is the god of commerce. And the caduceus, though, was the official emblem of Pergamus, interestingly enough. 
And so we have uh, all kinds of caduces you see around here. They have actually studied 242 logos of American organizations relating to health or medicine. And uh, the caduces uh, or the staff of Asclepius uh, are used in most of those, obviously. And uh, from the 70s to 1970s through 1980s. And this study was kind of interesting because uh, professional associations more likely use the staff of Asclepius, 62%, while the commercial organizations, uh, about uh, 76%, use the uh, caduces. Exception is for hospitals. 37% use the staph Escalapius versus 63 for the caduces, but remember hospitals are usually commercial. Anyway, but it's kind of interesting, so I, I'm not sure that's a, I want to hit that too hard, but I thought you'd get a kick out of that. When you see the two-headed snake, you're talking about the god of commerce in, co in contrast to the god of healing, okay? But uh, they also, in, in Pergamos, had uh, health institutions, which dealt with, uh, this is presumably uh, started by Hippocrates, he, uh, it, for about 800 years, they featured mostly psychiatric kinds of things, psychological things. Uh, sleep was induced by priests and using drugs and other things. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, obviously a very close mix of uh, attempts at healing and, and, attempts and, and their religious structure. Well, let's get into the letter to Pergamos. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos write. Now, the word Pergamos is... Uh, a combined a combination of two words in the Greek. The per, as a prefix, means mixed or objectionable. We use that like pervert or perturbation. It's something that's unanticipated or different. It's, it's inappropriate, is the idea. And uh, the, the suffix, gamos, means marriage. You speak of monogamy, bigamy, polygamy. That suffix refers to marriage. So pergamos means mixed marriage or objectionable marriage, strangely enough. That's not the only read. The word... Pergo can also mean high, so some, this also can mean in the Greek a high marriage. There, there are, like many of these things, there's wor plays on words in, in each direction. But uh, unto the angel of the church, but very right away we see Pergamus, we can suggest that that implies an inappropriate marriage is going to be in par part of the letter. And then Jesus uses of his title. Next comes, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Remember in the early, chapter 1, that was one of the uh, attrib attributions to Jesus Christ. What is the sharp sword with two edges? The Word of God. And that's going to turn out to be the primary remedy to the situation that e emerges in Pergamos. Well, he starts, then he starts with his report card. I know thy works. Just like he did several of the other letters. I know thy works. Jesus knows what we're doing better than we do. He says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is? Whew. Is that literal? When we do these studies, you know, I, I, I know people come up to me, check, you know, was his seat literally there? I believe it was. I'll show you why. See, we've got to remember only God is omnipresent. The angels aren't. They're local. They have locality. Demons aren't. They have look strangely. You know, you think they're spirit beings. They can be anywhere. No, we learn from the scripture that even demons have boundaries. You're, you're River Euphrates for certain reasons. And in Daniel uh, 10, we get strange glimpses. So they have locality, strangely enough. In any case, see, Satan can't be everywhere at once. It may seem like that at times because he's got a lot of help. <laughs> even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. You know, it's interesting, every time God talks about His name, it's always singular. The name itself is Elohim. It can be a plural form referring to the Trinity. But when God speaks of my name, throughout the Bible, it's singular. He doesn't say my names. He has several renderings of His names. We can make lists of those. But the concept of His name is singular. His authority, His person, His, his reality. Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Boy, boy, boy. Now, the, who is, one of the other questions comes, who is Antipas? We don't know. There are some early church fathers that uh, think there was a specific guy named Antipas. In fact, there's stories about him being shut up in a brazen bull and it was heated up red hot. And he ended his life in, uh, as he died in this ordeal. Uh, he was praying and singing songs till he died, till he martyred. Uh, another uh, group of authors feel that the word Antipas in the Greek means against all. 
And that may be, an, uh, it's almost like a, a, both may be true. In other words, he's against, he, was, he stood alone, is the idea. I wouldn't make too much of his name because Herod had Antipas as a name too. So there were probably, it was probably not an uncommon name in those early years. But anyway, Antipas can mean in the Greek against all. And that also apparently describes his situation because he obviously was, he's getting committed here as a faithful martyr during these very days. But the main thing, this issue of Satan, here's where we could depart into a whole special study on the reality of Satan. And let me just cut through it quickly, because I think for this audience, most of you realize that Satan is real. It's not an idiom for evil in some broad sense. He's a person. He's malevolent. He's very resourceful. His character, he's a murderer from the beginning, Jesus says. Jesus describes him as a person in John 8 and elsewhere. He is a deceiver. We'll encounter him in Revelation 12, and we will study his shenanigans there from Genesis to Revelation in the overview. Uh, he's a liar. He always was, he's a, from Genesis 3 on. And of course, he obviously is a sinner, but that's very confirmed for you in 1 John 3, 8 and elsewhere. His domain. He has a vast demonic kingdom. That's, and we're going to encounter that also as we get into Revelation 12. He also is in charge of the world system. Remember when Jesus was tempted in his famous temptations after his 40 days fasting after his baptism. Satan shows Jesus somehow all the nations of the world. And he makes the boast that they're all given to me and I can give them to him or I will. And I'll give them to you if, you just, but if you'll worship me. That would not have been a temptation if he didn't have claim to them. If I tried to sell you the, the uh, Sears Tower in Chicago, you're not tempted to buy it from me because you don't think I own it. In order for you to be tempted, you have to believe that, hey, I really have the deed. And I'll sell it to you for ten grand. You're not tempted because you know I'm don't own. In other words, in order for you to be tempted to take my deal, you have to have the confidence that I have the deal to present. You follow me? Satan offered all the nations to Christ to give them if he would be worshipped, and, and, and obviously Jesus declined, not because he didn't own them, but he had a, he, he was there. For, he was not willing to take a shortcut around the cross. But the world system belongs to Satan. We need to remember that as we look at the world and we see pain and suffering and and, and, and uh, evil. We need to remember who the God of this world is. And know that Satan has locality. He can't be everywhere at one time. He's not omnipresent. He has a number of strange... He's obviously our adversary, right? That's what the word Satan actually means. In 1 Timothy 5, 1 Peter 5. He's the accuser of the brethren. You know, there are prominent people on public platforms that make their living tearing apart members of the body of Christ over some imagined differences or what have you. There are people I know, they're very prominent, whose marketing strategy to be an accuser of the brethren. I know where that doctrine comes from. Despite what differences we might share with some of those speakers that are being attacked, let's recognize that, that, what, what that's what's really happening there. He's the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's the prince of the power of the air. And when we get through the, in Revelation, the seals, and then the trumpets, and the bowls, the climactic element of the climax altogether is poured out upon the air. We'll explore that when we get there. But that's obviously, it's the Satan's seat and then his, his domain. He's the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, according to Ephesians 2 too. He's the enemy that sowed the tares in Matthew 13, your famous parable of the, of the four soils. And at least six times he's simply called the wicked one. I didn't even bother to list those. There's, he has many more titles. His man, the Antichrist, has 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. We'll deal with that when we get to Revelation 13. Let's talk a little bit about spiritual geography. There is locality of Satan and his demons. He is not omnipresent. They are territorial. Study Daniel 10. And we'll see that when you get to Revelation 9 and Revelation 16. They are they're concerned. Even in the book of Job, even Satan himself, subject to restrictions. They can't do anything they like. God has put them under constraints. And anything that happens to you has to be father filtered if you're a Christian. Now something else about his geography, you know, we all understand that the Nimrod, uh, the first world dictator, founded Babel, which becomes Babylon. What most people don't realize is that when Cyrus conquered the Bab Babylon, the priests and their initiates and their treasures set up shop in Pergamos. They got out of there. 
And as Rome rises, uh, they go to, uh, they get known as the Etruscan uh, Mysteries and they set up shop in Rome. So the centroid of, of idolatry and false worship goes from Babylon to Pergamos to Rome. That's the migration. Jesus says, hold, hold fast my name to the church there. That's all, name is always singular. And I want to underscore this whole area of the third commandment. Most of us don't understand what God says in the Ten Commandments when He says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He is not talking about vocabulary. That commandment, in my opinion, has nothing to do with, with the swearing or foul language in that sense. It has to do with ambassadorship. And the instruction to this church is to hold fast my name. The instruction to you and I is to hold fast His name. Let's try to understand what that may mean. So here's the concern that Jesus has for these people. He says, he, he gave them the good news, and He says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, we'll come to that, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, and, he, and repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, with the word of God. Well, here we have one of those cases, we're going to run into several of them, where Jesus uses a reference from the Old Testament to make a point. And for us to understand the point he's really making, we need to understand what is this all about? Who was Balaam? Who was Balak? What's he talking about? So let's take a look at the prophet Balaam. He's a strange character. He is a strange character. He's a prophet, but he's not Jewish. I, I believe he was a Gentile. He's called in jo Joshua 13 a soothsayer. He's not called a prophet. He calls himself a prophet. No, he's a soothsayer. He's from Mesopotamia, it turns out, in Deuteronomy 23. In fact, specifically, he's from the river Euphrates in the area called Aram. So he's, in a sense, what we might think of as an Iraqi. He might have been, even been from Babylon. It doesn't say that specifically, but could be. So he's a strange character. Now he is, by, he is hired by the king of Israel's enemies, the Moabites. Balak is the king of the Moabites. And he's hired Balaam to curse Israel. God tells Balaam not to go. Shall I go? God says, no. He asks him again, shall I go? No. Shall I go? Well, go if you have to. So he goes, and God's upset about him going. Somehow, Balaam didn't get the message. See, one thing we should always be sensitive to, what God may permit and what He may prefer are maybe two different things. Well, gee, will God allow me to get a new van? I don't know. Does He want you to have one? It's a different, that's more the question. Can a Christian dance? Can a Christian drink beer? Hey, the question is, what, do, what does God prefer you to do under the, whatever the circumstances are? So Balaam, on his way there, his donkey keeps bumping the side of the, the, this bridge or the, on the trail. And he beats the donkey three times until the donkey turns and chews him out. <laughs> <laughs> the donkey speaks to Balaam. That got his attention. That got his attention. It's a weird, weird story. But Balaam was a weird guy. But then the angel... The, the reason that ba the, the donkey wouldn't go forward, the donkey could see the angel was blocking the way, Balaam couldn't. When the angel's revealed, then Balaam realized he's in deep yogurt here. And so, but then, he's, but then the angel says, go, but don't say any more than I let you say, speak. So he goes to Balak, hires himself out, that's one of, he's going, doing it for money. Balak wants him to curse Israel, and he refuses, to, he has his moment, because in, in, in Numbers 23 and 24, where there's this interaction with Balaam and uh, Balak, uh, the king of Moab wants him to curse Israel, and Balaam won't do it, because God, he, he, he will not say things to Balak that God didn't tell him to say. He'll say, gee, he's doing all right here. Um, in fact, he has a very strange prophecy there in Numbers 24, where he talks about a star out of Jacob. And some people presume that that may have some relationship to the so-called Christmas star or whatever in Bethlehem. But that's all conjecture. It's not that crisp or clear, frankly. But what's not obvious until you read the rest of the story in Numbers 31, some chapters later, what apparently Balaam did do, he taught the king. He, could, he wouldn't curse Israel because God didn't let him do that. But he tipped Balak off on how to get Israel defeated. 
He in effect said, get your good-looking single girls and have them camp around the outside of the camp of Israel, entice these young men into fornication and marriage and whatever else, and that, and that was prohibited in the Torah. They were not to me- they were not only keep separate, they were specifically, the Torah says, you're not supposed to marry a Moabite. They did. That caused God's displeasure, that brought judgment on the land and so forth. But Balaam's role in all this, he was the one that taught Israel's enemies on how to get Israel corrupted. Get the picture? Okay. So, we have three references to Balaam in the New Testament. In Revelation, we, here we saw the doctrine of Balaam. This whole idea of spiritual unchastity, marriage with the world, is the theme here in this whole letter. Second Peter 2 uses the expression, the way of Balaam, apparently referring to the fact that he was a hireling. He was making a market for his gift, if you will. He sold his, his gift of prophecy for money, for the way of Balaam. And Jude 11 also makes a reference to that, the error of Balaam sacrificing eternal riches for temporal gain. Now we may be splitting hairs here. These are the three phrases that occurs in the New Testament and they're probably essentially the same thing, slight nuances of emphasis in the different ones. We'll move on. After all that, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Then we have the promise of the overcomer. You know what's strange about this? Here again, you notice the promise of the overcomer comes after the letter closes. It's sort of like a P.S. Jesus says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Boy, this is... Now, the hidden manna is pretty easy stuff. Um, Now, what does the word manna mean? What is it? We find it's like a coriander seed, you know, all in Exodus 16, where it was given to Israel for, to, for a sustenance for 40 years. Um, some commentators, when they read the prophecy of you're going to, boy, if you do what God wants you here, you'll, he'll give you hidden manna. And they say, same to you. I, <laughs> you want manna? This, this stuff? Same thing every day? Six days? On the sixth day, there's twice as much because they wouldn't get it on the seventh. You know, it's interesting. The Sabbath was instituted in, in Exodus 16. That's Four chapters before the law was given, by the way. It's an interesting issue. But the word manna means, what is it? What is this stuff? Forty years they had manna for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Manna biscuits. Manna muffins. Manna pancakes. Manna waffles. Manna cotti. Served, of course, with Manashevitz, I suppose. (laughs) Now, we may make fun of it and so forth. It was collected for six days only. It wasn't available on the seventh, which tells you the Sabbath was in effect long before the law was given. It's described poetically throughout the Bible. It's called the food from heaven and the bread of the mighty in Psalm 78, all through there. The bread of heaven in Psalm 105. But the capstone to what Jesus is really talking about comes from John 6. Because most of that chapter is the famous I am the bread of life discourse. So if you want to understand the hidden manna, that promise, what it really means, that's easy. John 6, take a read it. It'll be, it'll be crystal clear. We're talking about Jesus Christ himself. And he describes it very graphically there. Now before I, before I get back, let me just go back here and get to one other thing. I'll give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth. This is the one area in the entire book that most scholars have no idea what it might mean. All kinds of conjectures, and I won't take you through them all because they're just conjectures. The one that is still a conjecture, but the one that appeals to me, apparently, the Roman practice was to give you a white stone with your name on it, which, was a, which would give you food and access to the games. That was what they had, like a ticket to the to Colosseum. It was, a, it was the one where the government, would, you had that stone, you would get some bread, and you would get to see the games. That was, it had your name on it. That was, it was like your identity. You didn't have driver's licenses, or, you know, that, the same idea. So, uh, the white stone with a name written on it, so forth, may be idiomatically taken from that practice, but that's conjecture. We don't have any good records on any of that. But anyway, that manna we've talked about. So, okay, we had Smyrna. Went through all of that last time. Now, we've gone through Pergamus. 
The name means mixed marriage. The title is the word of God, deals with the word of God. And both the commendation and the concerns and the exhortation deals with this whole idea of spiritual mor uh, uh, morality, avoiding spiritual immorality, spiritual chastity, if I can use that term. So, admonitory to all churches. Well, Ephesus was, the idea of Ephesus was you had devotion, not just doctrine. That made sense. Smyrna, the main message to Smyrna was to endure persecution. You'll be tried for ten days and so forth. For Pergamos, it's to purify your ambassadorship. Hold fast to my name was his admonition. That'll become clear as I get uh, go, go, go a little further here. The other application is to us personally. Let's talk, how do, we, how do we apply these personally? Well, the whole story of Ephesus was neglected priorities. They were sound on doctrine, but they were short on devotion. God wants devotion, not just doctrine. Smyrna, of course, the whole issue there was satanic opposition. Satan was at work persecuting the church. And Jesus' message to them was just hang in there. Pergamos is spiritual compromise. Spiritual compromise. That's exactly what Bala, ba Balaam taught Balak to take advantage of, and Israel compromised itself with, with the sexual immorality in the, in the sexual sense, but also the spiritual immorality by taking on the idols of these girls. In other words, the guys would uh, uh, get tangled up with these girls, get married, and adopt the, the uh, gods of the Moabites. And that was what caused God to bring a judgment upon Israel. The promises of the overcomer. Ephesus, eat of the tree of life. Smyrna will be not heard of the second death. Again, it's death, death, death through that one. And we have the man of stone and name promised here. Who is the overcomer is the question. Well, everybody, it's easy to get on a legalistic trip here if you're not careful. You might put in your notes 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, where John, the writer of the book of Revelation, writes to you what the overcomer, who the overcomer is. In 1 John 5, he says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So these overcomer promises are to, those, are to people of faith. And uh, so, again, faith is the issue. Let's not forget that as we go forward. Well, we've talked about local, the, the local admonitory and personal. Let's get to this controversial one, and the fog may lift on the whole thing for you. You need to understand a little bit more about the Babylonian legend. Tammuz was the posthumous son between Nimrod and Semiramis, presumably. He's associated with the sun god. He was thought to die at the winter solstice. You know, as the days get shorter and shorter and shorter, when the days get the shortest, he's thought, the sun god is thought to have died. And then he's resurrected, if you will, in the days that follow, as the days start getting longer again. So they, they're very sensitive. The days getting shorter. The sun god dies. There's a death and resurrection theme of all of this. They celebrated all of this. The night that he dies, they burned a Yule log. The word Yule in Chaldean means infant. They burn this log in the fireplace, and then the next morning they replace it with a trim tree. That sound familiar? It's in, if you, what you, every time you get around Christmas time, be sure you do a study in the first half, half a dozen verses of Jeremiah 10. If nothing else, it'll pull you on a guilt trip for a while. It'll be kind of fun. Um, so, um, also the mistletoe, the wassail bowl, all these th things that we think of coming from a, 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 of a British, you know, British tradition actually has its roots in pagan Rome, which has its roots in Babylon. Now, Nimrod founded the original Babylonian religion, obviously. He's virtually identical to Phaethon or Aesculapius in uh, some accounts, and uh, developing the worship of his widow Semiramis and his posthumous son Tammuz. It's called Semiramis and Tammuz in Babylonian. It's Ashtoreth and Tammuz of Phoenicia. He's the Isis or Horus of Egypt. He's the Aphrodite and Eros of, uh, Eros of uh, Greece. And Venus and Cupid of Rome. These are simply Latin or Greek labels to the original Chaldean. You follow me? And all of this, if you want, there's two great... The classic study here is Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons. We'll be talking more about this when we get to Revelation 17 and 18. But there's a contemporary book that's even better. And that is Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. Every serious Christian, I think, should get Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. We have some differences of views on some things. I'll tell you about that when we get there. Not that uh, critical. But he's done a thorough job at documenting the background of what we're going to get into here. 
this priesthood from Babylon started to migrate. When Cyrus conquered Babylon, the, the, the priesthood and the initiates set up shop in Pergamos. And as the centroid of power eventually shifts to Rome, as, as the Rome, Romans supersede the Greeks, this same religious system adopts Latin labels and forms the foundation of what you and I think of as pagan Rome. If you study pagan Rome before the third, before the third and fourth century, uh, it's just a Latin packaging of the Babylonian uh, system. The title Pontifus Maximus was a title that the high priest of the Babylonian religion picked up when they moved from Babylon to Pergamus. It's first used in Pergamus. And G.H. Uh, uh, Pember's studies confirm all that. And so, obviously, uh, as, the, as the system gets, migrates to Rome, the appointment of each Caesar, in, of as many titles that he took on, one of them was the head of the church, which, which was Pontifex Maximus. It was the head of the Babylonian uh, religion. And this all gets codified in 378, uh, when the Damascus of the, the Bishop of Rome completes the absorption of the Babylonian system into the Roman Church. Now, you, if you're going to take your Bible seriously, you're going to want to do some background on the history of Rome. It gets founded in about 753 B.C. It, in uh, in uh, between, somewhere in the 4th uh, and 3rd centuries B.C., they subdue it Italy. They conquer Carthage in uh, 264 to 146 B.C. Then Greece and Asia Minor falls the following century. And then we, we get to Spain, Gaul, Britain, and the Teutons. And uh, uh, very graphically portrayed, among other things, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, they do a great job. Marcus, it's actually in the days of Marcus Aurelius. But I checked that out, by the way. Commodus, Commodius, Commodus, who took over from Marcus Aurelius, was killed in the arena. It's very interesting. Um, anyway, uh, in 63 BC, they conquered Judea. And when, at their peak... They span from the Atlantic to the Euphrates and from the North Sea to the African Desert. Now the population is estimated maybe to be 120 million. That might be a little low. But uh, along the way, of course, we get into Caesar worship. Augustus, when he takes over. This is uh, after Mark Anthony, uh, you know, the, the, the whole uh, uh, Octavian take, uh, wins that battle and, and uh, takes on the name Augustus. He also inaugurates emperor worship. And part of what he's trying to do here is to tie the empire together in, 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 a, in a, trying to enlist a common sentiment was, is the thought. And though even though Pergamus was not the seat of primary authority, it ends up becoming one of the major centers for emperor worship. The first temple that was dedicated to emperor worship was erected at Pergamus at 27 BC. This is all obviously ahead of the New Testament period, but it's important for this background. So Pergamus is not only pagan in the traditional pagan sense, it's also uh, pushing this idea of emperor worship. And uh, by the time you get to Vespasian, I'll give you a profile here in a minute, and his successors, it became a global test of loyalty to the Caesar to offer incense to a statue of the emperor. That was like a loyalty oath. All you had to do is put a pinch of, of material in the, in the offer and you'd get a certificate for another year that you're loyal to the empire. Vespasian em enforced that. So anyway, when you get to about 44 B.C., Julius Caesar is assassinated. And that's, then we have Augustus. And uh, it's in Augustus' reign that Christ was born, obviously. And uh, it's, he's succeeded by Tiberius. Christ was crucified in Tiberius' reign, just to give you a rough feeling here. Then we get to Caligula. And there is an incident that's going to be important to us as we study it, during Caligula's reign, he's a tough guy, but he instructs his general in Jerusalem to put an idol of himself in the Holy of Holies. And Petronius refuses to do that because he knows that will lead to a major explosion, as it did back in uh, 137 B.C., and I'll come back to that. Um, Caligula orders Petronius killed for uh, failing to follow instructions. Caligula happens to die two weeks later. The message of Caligula's death gets to Petronius before the order of his execution, so he gets off the hook, interestingly enough. But it's interesting to see God intervene in a way of not letting the abomination of desolation take place, which is what it would have done. That's going to happen when it should happen. So then we have Claudius. Then we have Nero, very infamous, of course. He's the one that burned Rome and got, tried to blame the Christians on it. He's the one that executed Paul. And the Senate, of course, orders his death and... Uh, very, very painful death, but he, he, he 
takes the, he commits suicide rather than endure that. Then we have, when Nero dies, Vespasian's down in Judea with his son, with orders to attack Jerusalem, but Nero dies. From 68 to 69, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius in succession take over for a short while, but it's just turbulence. Vespasian finally takes over the empire in 69, leaving his son Titus in, um, uh, to uh, attack Jerusalem. And of course, Titus does destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. But in that hiatus, the Christians get out because Christ warned them to in, in Luke chapter 21. Titus, though, aspires to, he then becomes emperor from 79 to 81, 10 years later. So they're at their zenith now. We get to Timitian. And Timitian, Timitian is a bad news. He's the worst of the bunch. And a very, very, very violent, very, very systematic. Um, and of course, this is when John is banished to Patmos. When Domitian dies, John is released. Trajan releases him. And the Trajan just tried to uphold the laws, but Christianity was regarded as illegal. So Trajan's not a good guy, but he doesn't have the zeal and the, 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 the uh, violence that Domitian, characterized Domitian. Then Hadrian, and then Antonius Pius. It's during Antonius Pius they have the Bar Kokhba revolt, and that's when Jerusalem is leveled, plowed, plowed underground, and a Roman city built on top of it, which is all part of your background if you go to Israel. And you get to Marcus Aurelius, which brings you to the period of the movie, The Gladiator, in terms of, of length here. Um, but he was the most severe since Nero, and this is the, probably the peak of Roman power. And Commodus, uh, Commodus is the son of, uh, uh, of uh, Aurelius, and he did, uh, uh, Commodus dies in the arena, interestingly enough. And then there's a whole series of what they call the Barak Emperors, appointed by the army, their civil war, and then there's a series of others that tolerate, some of them tolerate Christianity, they're too busy trying to scotch tape the end, the empire's starting to come apart. Uh, Elagabas, uh, Alexander Severus, Maximinus, and we get to Philip's and uh, Decius, Valerian. Um, some uh, that, that were favorable, some of them are uh, serious persecutors, until you finally get to Diocletian. And he's the worst of the bunch. Diocletian uh, persecutes Christians furiously, and uh, he tried to be especially tortuous to discourage that whole movement. That's the, then you get to this interesting guy by the name of Constantine who's widely misunderstood. In 312 AD he set out to defeat the forces of Maxentius, his rival, the supreme power in the empire. His father had prospered when he prayed to the God of the Christians, and so he in his extremity resorted to the same action. We're we were, we were told that on the next day he saw a shining cross in the sky with the inscription above it, uh, in hoc signo vinces, that is, in this sign thou shalt conquer. Whether this really happened or whether it was a clever press release afterwards, it's up to you to see, decide how cynical you are. But he, in any case, he does defeat Maxentius at the Milvan Bridge, and that he immediately declares his conversion to Christianity. At least that's the way the record says. Other records says he was baptized on his deathbed. So whether he really was converted or not, or whether he just took advantage of this as a, as a public relations thing, is a subject that scholars argue about. But in 325 AD, he, e he issued his Edict of Toleration that established the freedom of religion. This was a big break for the Christians, because up till now, Christianity had been an illegal underground movement. He did not make it a state religion. He simply made it legal. He favored Christians at court. He exempted Christian ministers from taxes. He issued a general exhortation for subjects to become Christians. So this is all the positives. In 320, excuse me, 330 AD, he moved the capital of the world to Byzantium from Rome. He had, he had, Rome was so up to its ears in uh, pagan traditions, he decided it would be simpler just to move the capital of the world out of there. And he moved it to a place called Byzantium that then he renamed Constantinople. It later gets renamed Istanbul by the, by the Muslims when they take over, ultimately. But Constantine has quite a record where you try to see what he actually did. He ceased the gladiator, gladiator fights. He stopped that. He reduced the killing of unwelcome children. He abolished crucifixion as a form of execution. He repealed the persecution edicts of his predecessor, Diocletian. He assumed the headship of the church. He's the one that impaneled the Council of Nicaea and so forth. He advanced Christians to high offices. He declared Sunday as a day of worship. Now, by the way, this is widely misunderstood. There were three major groups of sun worshipers 
operative at that time in the empire. You had the Christians that were illegal that were coming out of the caves. By declaring Sunday as a combined day of worship, it was his way of trying to unify the emperor, e empire. Because he had three different groups of sun worshipers that could share that day. The Christians could worship on that day. And the big news was the slaves had a day off. That was a big deal. They didn't have a day off. Constantine forbid work on Sunday and that made, declared it as a day of worship. And uh, so he also reduced slavery in a lot of different ways. So the marriage was consummated between the world and the church. Because what happens is after Constantine dies, Julian takes over and he is known as Julian the Apostate. The Julian Calendar, same guy. He sought to restore paganism. He was not favorable to the Christian cause at all. But he is replaced, after just a couple of years, jo by Jovian, who reestablished the Christian religion. So this attempt at paganism was just two, two years, then Jovian takes over. And then we get to Theodosius. And he's the one that made Christianity the state religion. That caused forced conversions, and suddenly all the churches were filled with unregenerate people that, were, that had an ambition to rule, that were used to heathenism, and we have now a commingling of Christianity, or at least a form of it, and the paganism that, uh, that was uh, operative throughout the culture. So this is regarded by most scholars as a marriage between the church and the world. A perverted marriage. Heathenism was Christianized. The pagan temples became churches. Heathen festivals were converted into Christian ones. This December 25th thing we do, we call Christmas, is really a derivative of pagan holidays. Well, what they know about the birth of Christ was that it wasn't in the winter, and so on. We could, I won't go down all that. Pagan priests slipped into the office as Christian priests. Most of the changes were simply nomenclature, giving, giving these Christian names to their previous practices. So what the persecution didn't accomplish in Smyrna was accomplished in a marriage to the world. If you can't lick them, join them. Satan changes his strategy. Trying to crush the myrrh, the Smyrna, didn't work. The blood of the martyrs is the seat of the church, according to the early fathers. But then making it a legal, a state religion destroyed it. So we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. Ephesus, the apostolic church. Then we go through the persecuted church. And Pergamus is the married church. And next time, of course, we'll take Thyatira. In your next session... What I'd like you to do is read chapters 2 and 3. I know we've done, in other words, they're short. Just read both chapters so you have all seven letters refreshed in your mind. And I want you to analyze the letter to Thyatira. It's the longest of the bunch. None of them are very long. It's, from, it's only about uh, 10 verses. But analyze the letter. Figure out what the good news is and what the bad news is with Thyatira. It's a very important letter. It's the longest. It deals with a person called Jezebel. Is anyone here named Jezebel? <laughs> Does anyone here have a dog named Nero? See, some of these names you wouldn't even give your dog, right? <laughs> Study Jezebel. It's important. First of all, it's a very colorful period in, in, in uh, Israel's history. She is quite an operator. Um, you need to understand Jezebel for several reasons. Not the least of which, Jesus alludes to her with respect to the church at Thyatira. So I'll give you a clue. Most of that story will be in 1 Kings 21. You want to read about a guy by the name of Naboth. He had a vineyard. And it's absolutely fascinating to see how that whole situation is dealt with because I think it becomes a foreshadowing of something far larger, far more sinister than you have any idea. So that's your assignment for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. The letter to the church at Pergamos, spiritual compromise. The lessons to the church, pretty obvious. So we need to ferret out the paganism that indwells all of our churches to some extent. It's easy to be critical of certain ones. Let's examine ourselves. It also needs to be very, very operative in our personal lives. Because all of us find ourselves compromising with the world. We are to be His ambassadors. 
How often do we compromise our ambassadorship for the sake of protecting a job or protecting a deal or not offending a neighbor or whatever? There are a lot of these gray areas. I'm not saying it's simple. But we need to put the test of ambassadorship on these decisions. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together and that we have a divine appointment with you tonight. We thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. So, Father, our first prayer is that your purpose be accomplished in each of our lives. Because we do come before your throne, Father, acknowledging our sin, our sins of ingratitude, our sins of presumption. Oh, Father, how we do presume. We ask you, Father, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might be more effective stewards of these treasures that you've given us. Indeed, Father, we would just pray that you would increase in each of us a new sense of responsibility as your ambassadors, as your representatives. We pray, Father, that you would give us discernment in the opportunities that you unfold before us. That in each of these things we might be more fruitful stewards and more pleasing in your sight. As we commit ourselves, Father, without any reservations into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.